y'all, and welcome to Trials to Triumphs. I'm Ashley Blaine Featherson Jenkins, but you can call me ABFJ. This week, four-time Olympic gold medalist and star of The Real Housewives of Atlanta, Sonia Richards-Ross talks to me about the power of prayer and preparation. From a very young age, Sonia understood the power of the tongue, predicting her Olympic win at just nine years old. Years later, Sonia prepared herself mentally and spiritually to close that chapter of her life by drawing strength from her faith. I had written a prayer that I I literally almost said every single day. And the gist of it was, you know, God, I know that every good thing that you give us doesn't last a lifetime. And I'm so grateful for the blessing of running and what it has brought for me, but I'm gonna be giving this gift back to you at the end of the year. And I said that prayer for like a year. And I just kept telling myself, I'm more than an athlete. Like all the things that I've brought to sport, I can bring to the world in a new way. Hi, Sonia. Welcome to the pod. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited for this conversation. I am so excited to chat with you. I always like to start off with like how I've met people. So you and I haven't met in person, Mm -hmm. but you and Aaron were early like couple goals for me. Like years and years and years ago, I remember (laughs) seeing you all on Instagram and being like, who are these beautiful, black, Uh talented, athletic, (laughs) fit black folks? Like I want to be like them. So I just Uh had to let you know that it was just seeing you and your husband thrive. This is literally years ago, probably like early Instagram days. Um, And to see you now uh, and where you are in your marriage with your family is just so beautiful. And you've been such an inspiration to me. So I'm just really excited to get to know you more and learn more about your story, Sonia. Well, Ashley, that means a lot to me. Um, And my relationship and my family means everything to me. So, you know, it, 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 it is fulfilling to hear when people say that our relationship inspires them because I certainly believe that doing life with someone else that loves you wholeheartedly and supports you is just the greatest blessing. So thank you so much. That means yes. a lot to me. And you're yeah, I so can't welcome, wait to share sis. more. <laughs> it's true though. And and still I'm like, they look good. I'm here <laughs> for the Rosses. Okay. Hey, like thank yes. You. <laughs> All right, so we're going to start with some icebreaker questions. Are you ready? All right. Yes, I'm ready. <laughs> okay, so if you could go back in time and relive one race from your entire career, what would it be and why? Um, so there was there's always one race I wish I could get back in my career, and that was the Beijing 400-meter final where I finished third, where I was favored to win. And, um, yeah, if I could go back in time, I'd go back to that race. I think that um, I had a lot of things going on. I didn't get a lot of sleep the night before, got a little bit too fast in the race, and I wish I would have had the control, the poise, the confidence I had had through the whole season and through the majority of my career, because I feel like that gold medal should have been mine. Mm. So if I could relive one moment in time, it would be like the day leading up to that race and that race um, and, you know, and won it. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. That's a good one. That's a good one. It's an honest one. I like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So my last question is, so you predicted your Olympic gold win at nine years old, which I was like, yes, Sonia, you better... Speak over your life? Yes, Yes. right? So I want to know, what else have you spoken into existence that's come to pass? Oh, I mean, damn near everything. Mm. Damn near everything. My mom, my mom always says that's my superpower. And that's the one thing that she wishes that she could take from me is this ability to just speak the things that I want um, and not have this fear that I think a lot of people have about telling other people what they want to do because people most of the times will be like, oh, it's not going to happen. But I mean, I, you know, even so when I retired in 2016, Lewis Johnson, who is now my colleague, he comes over to me after my final race at the mm-hmm. Olympic trials in Eugene, Oregon. And he says to me, he's like, you know, you have done incredible things in your career. What can we expect for you to do next? And I said, I want to start a family. I want to write a book and I want to commentate. And literally NBC called me the next day to come and commentate. The next day. The next day that I I failed to make the team. My husband got to work immediately and we had a baby nine months later. (laughs) 
And I wrote three books, you know, I wrote three books. So it was really, it's really been, I do believe my superpower is that I am willing to speak the things that I want and I believe it can happen and will happen. And, you know, they, they happen. Mm, that's mm-hmm. good. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's just so much power in the tongue. It really is. It really is. And we have to be mindful of being very positive because we can catch ourselves getting in a negative spiral and Mm. those things will manifest as well. It's not only the positive things that Mm. we manifest. We also can manifest the negative things in our lives. So I'm very mindful of that. And I've been very grateful that a lot of the things that I have believed in and and spoken have actually happened in my life. Mm. Amen. I love that. Mm -hmm. That's great. All right. So let's start at the beginning. Talk to me about home. What would you say that Kingston, Jamaica and South Florida have given you? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, you know, Jamaica gave me my soul. You know, Jamaica gave me um, my culture and my identity. Um, I think a lot of times when I reflect on why I was always so bold and have been so confident in achieving the things that I've wanted, it's because when you come from a place like Jamaica, where all you see is Black excellence, right? Like the prime minister is black, the doctors, the teachers, everyone, everyone around you is black. That is no longer a barrier. Now the Mm. only barrier is excellence. Like how do I do the work to become great? And so I would say that Jamaica gave me that confidence as a young black girl that I could do anything. And specifically in track and field, because it was one of the most popular sports in our country. We had had already great success in the sport. Of course, Usain Bolt and Shelly and Fraser Price has elevated that for the country. But there was Merlene Ati before them, who was a superstar, who was my hero growing up. And so I would say Jamaica gave me that. It gave me that confidence. It gave me that culture, that soul that I think every young Black girl should have Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, and have an opportunity to experience at a young age. Um, And then Florida was a really great place for me to really mature as an athlete. You know, I went to St. Thomas Aquinas High School. I was a great academic uh, uh, institution and also a great sports institution. Um, the coaches were phenomenal. Um, my dad was there every single day with me along the journey, nurturing me as well. But South Florida kind of was this place where I was able to develop as a young woman and as a young athlete, and then obviously going on to Texas and then, you know, staying there for many years and developing to become this Olympic champion. But, you know, I always say I got the best of both worlds, like being in Jamaica, such such a great foundation for me. And then coming to a country with so much resources and support allowed me to live my dreams. Mm. I I love what you said about Jamaica, because Jamaica is one of my favorite countries in the world. Mm -hmm. And it's because every time I go, I feel exactly what you just said. Yeah. It is so special and and, and beautiful to be around beautiful Black people all the time who are, you know, doing amazing things and who are just lovely people and and kind and welcoming. And Mm -hmm. everybody, I feel like, treats me like family every time I go to Jamaica. And it's (laughs) it's very it's it's a lovely country. And Mm -hmm. and for for you, it was you had that growing up in Jamaica. For me, though, that was my experience when I went to Howard University. Yeah, it was like I I made that that choice of like, you were born into it. I kind of had to make the choice to like go to the Mecca where I could be surrounded by black excellence and beautiful black folks all the time. And Mm -hmm. like you said, it changed my life. Mm -hmm. Truly, it's it's life changing and it's really important. So I I really encourage black Mm -hmm. folks, if you're not born into it at some point in your life, seek it because it's transformative. It really is. Talk to me about your mom. Oh. What are what are some moments over your life that you can remember that you experienced with your mom that changed your life or that you that it will always stick with you and that you'll continue to pass on to your children? Yeah, my mom is just, you know, continues to be uh the perfect example of what it means to be selfless um and to prioritize the joys um, and and happiness and experiences of your children. Um, 
And I, you know, it's hard for me to talk my mom and I talk, talk about my dad together because yes, I feel please. like he they, was next. So we could talk about both. Yeah. Of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They, they were kind of the perfect balance for me as an athlete. And then also just in, in my life period. So my dad was the one who had this big vision, right? Like I tell people, uh, the reason I said at nine, I wanted to be an Olympic champion was because my dad said it first. Like he was mm-hmm. like, you're going to be an Olympic champion. He would, he believed in me before I believed in myself. Um, or before I saw it for myself, the full vision for myself, mm-hmm. I was only repeating what he had told me I could do because he had seen that in me at such a young age. And so my dad had this big vision and, um, my mom was always kind of my soft place to land, right? Like my mom was the one who would be like, it's just, it's just a sport. Like, you know, you're, you're more than just an athlete. And, and she was the one who kind of, you know, provided that great balance, which I think is important. You got to have someone who sees the drive in you who will not make you make excuses because they know you can be great. That's what my dad was. He was like, yep. He's like, okay, cry now, but we're going to get to the mountaintop because that's where you belong. And then my mom was kind of the soft landing, you know, where she'd be like, oh, let's go shot. Let's go do something else. Like focus Mm -hmm. on something else. Um, and, and throughout my career, my mom actually ended up being my manager and we traveled the entire world together. And, I, you know, some of the experiences that I've, I have with my mom are so unique and so special because of what we were doing together. Um, but the reality is my mom had her own life. Like she was doing her own thing. And I remember, I'll never forget, um, after my first year of being professional and not really loving my experience with my manager and agent, I said to her, mom, I need you. I need you to, to manage me. And I, I know you have, you have, you have all the right skill sets to do this. And she was like, son, Okay. <laughs> and she just took this leap of faith and, you know, left her job and, and started working with me full time. And it just is a, a small picture into how there was never a sacrifice that was too big that mm. she was willing to make to, to, to help me to live my dreams. And she's still that person now, you know, she's just, she's just wonderful. And she's, if you've never seen my mom before, she is this beautiful black woman. And she's even more beautiful. I mean, on the so you can't I, even imagine. <laughs> I, well, here's the thing. I was. I have to mention that. Truly, <laughs> one of the most beautiful people I've ever seen yeah, in my life. She's, like she's she stunning, and that yeah. makes sense. That she is just as beautiful on the inside because, honey, the yeah. outside is outsiding. Okay, <laughs> the outside is outsiding. I mean, and she just celebrated her 60th birthday, Ashley. Oh. And I'm telling you, she is goals, goals, goals. She walked in. I said, "Yes, <laughs> that's my mama." <laughs> she is just fabulous. I love that. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, and you know what else I love, Sonia? And this is something that I'm I'm um uh experiencing about you by watching you on the Real Housewives of Atlanta mm-hmm. is that I think it's really beautiful that you're not afraid to call on your family. Yeah. Like that's what family is for. Mm-hmm. Truly. Like mm-hmm. nobody knows you better than family. Nobody loves right. you more than family. And I think it's very admirable that you have incorporated your family into your life and you are so incorporated into your family's lives that um, it's no wonder that you have such a beautiful life and such a successful life. Did you ever have a moment in your career when you just were like, I don't know if I can or want to do this anymore? Yeah, I I certainly did Um, towards the end of my career. So I I suffered uh, from a really bad toe injury, foot injury. Most people don't know that's what ended my career was I I had this condition called uh, hallux rigidus, which is like having severe arthritis in a joint. Mm -hmm. And so although I have um, was 20 years old. It's like I had a 90 year old toe <laughs> and wow. it was very painful. I started to have bone on bone, um, rubbing in my, in that joint, in my big toe joint. Ooh. And so I ended up having three surgeries after the 2012 games. I uh, thank God I didn't have the first one before. Cause the doctor kept telling me, Oh, we'll just shave it down. You'll have more space. And it made it seem like it was gonna be a very easy procedure. And it was not, it was very traumatic and caused me a lot of, a lot of pain. And so between 2012 and 2016, that was a really tough time in my career because I just, I was in so much pain. Running had always been so easy for me. So fun. Like, you know, like 
I mean, training wasn't easy. Training was hard, but running (laughs) came easy to me. Mm -hmm. Um, And so during that time, I, you know, I just, I I questioned it so much. And I was like, is it worth it to keep doing all this for this? And, um, and then ultimately in 2016, I chose to retire because of my, because of how much pain I had been through Mm. to, to get to that point. But yeah, I would say up until 2012, I never thought, I thought I'd run forever. And yeah. then those last four years were just really hard. What did the months or I guess maybe first year that followed that feel like for you? Like, were you were you uh, initially able to very much so accept the pivot or was or was the pivot really tough for you? So, um, you know, Ashley, I always tell people that I prepared myself mentally, physically, and spiritually for retirement Mm. because, so I was on year 13 of my professional career when I retired and I had seen a lot of athletes retire before me. A lot of my peers retire before me. Um, my husband retired a year or two before I did. And I saw how hard it was for most people to, to, to make that pivot. And so I, I had written a prayer that I, I literally almost said every single day. And the gist of it was, you know, God, I know that every good thing that you give us doesn't last a lifetime. Mm-hmm. And I'm so grateful for the blessing of running um, and what it has brought for me. But I'm going to be giving this gift back to you at the end of the year. Ooh, um, wow. Yeah, that... so too, yeah. <laughs> oh, wow, Sonia. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it back to you. And I hope that oh. you're proud of what I've done with it. You know, and I said that prayer for like a year. Like, and I just oh. kept telling myself, I'm more than an athlete. Like all the things that I've brought to sport, I can bring to the world in a new way. And so I was mentally preparing for it. And that's why when I did that interview with Lewis and he asked me, what will I do next? I was ready. Like I knew mm. what I was going to do next. And I knew where I was going to make an impact in the world. And um, so it wasn't as hard on me as I think for most people, especially because I had this goal to go to Rio. I wanted to go as an athlete and I got to go as a commentator. And so it was still very fulfilling, right? Like I still made my fourth Olympic team just this time I was going to be commentating, you know? So I think my transition was easier because I was, I was so prepared, but it's not easy to give up this thing that you've loved your whole life. That was a a big defining part of your character. It's, it's certainly not easy uh, to Mm, do that. That prayer. You know, but it says a lot about who you are. And it says a lot, it, going back to what we talked about earlier, about how you speak things over your life. Yeah. So not only were you, you know, you were preparing yourself, but you were in agreement with God that like, mm. I know that mm. I'm entering into the next phase and I want you to know right. that I'm ready. Yeah. And And thank you. And and, and you, you were yeah. honoring the years and the season yeah. that you had yeah. that your previous season, you were ready to walk into the next one. And I think, yeah. you know, preparation, Sonia, is so important it, it, for mm-hmm. everybody. But I think especially when you're an athlete, you can't yeah. be unprepared. It's like what you were saying about um, the race you wish you could do over. Like you're like, yeah, yeah, I didn't get enough sleep. It wasn't you. You know, it was that you didn't prepare in the right. way that you wish you had. And that's why you're right. like, you know, it's the same, yeah. you know, for me as an actor with auditions, the only auditions I ever feel a way about it are ones that I don't feel fully prepared for. Prepared for, absolutely. That's it. If I'm fully prepared, whether it goes well, whether it goes poorly, whether it doesn't matter what it is, even for conversations I'm having for my podcast, meetings, auditions, whatever I'm doing, if I'm prepared, then it is what it is and I'm comfortable with it. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree with that. Yeah. So when, who taught you the art of preparation? Or is it just who you've always been? Oh, man, that's a great question. Um, I would say that it's a little bit of both. I think my dad, um, ultimately, I would give him most credit because even I remember my dad would even so we would watch film, right, like of my races Mm -hmm. and he'd break them down. And my dad was so meticulous that we would even watch my interviews Because he was like, look, this is a part of, and this is when I was like in high school, I was like 14, 15. Like I wasn't even close (laughs) to, you know, and he's like, he's like, you got to slow down. You got to make sure you listen to the question. And so he wanted me to be prepared and be well-rounded, not just for my performances on the track, but all that would potentially come with being a star athlete. 
And so, yeah, I would definitely say my dad was the one. And even when I, he was always like, you know, when we were in school, he was like, if your classmates are getting a 4.0, so can you. What can you be doing to compete in the classroom? And so I, w- I would definitely have to give credit to my dad for that because he was the one who always had the vision of like what I could do and here's how we're going to get ready for it. So I think, I, think, I think that's something my dad instilled in me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that. All right. So let's talk about the leap to reality TV. All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I you, it was coming. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> I'm always very fast. Here's the thing. I love reality TV, right? Yep. Like I think that it is, it is, you're, it's special in the sense that you're able to get a peek into people's lives yes. and you know, you're able to be entertained, of course. You're able to be inspired. You're able to learn things. You're able to see uh, a lot of times, hopefully, beautiful friendships and whatever. But yeah. also, I, it is not lost on me that it is a very difficult life for those that are Live serving <laughs> as our entertainment, that are living it. Right. Right. And so every time yes. I watch an episode of whatever reality TV show, I always have the awareness of like, but that had to be tough that they did that mm-hmm. with cameras all around them, knowing that millions upon millions of people would watch this. Yeah. And so I want to know what was the conversation, Sonia, that you had with yourself mm-hmm. when you were like, okay, Sonia, you can do this or, or let's mm-hmm. do this. What, what did that conversation right. look like? So uh, the first thing for me is I am a person that says yes to life. Like that is my, that is what I lean to. It's like, if something comes my way, I'm, I, I say yes first, right? I'm like, okay, yes. Like, how am I going to figure this out? You know? Okay. Um, and so when I, when they reached out to me to do the Real Housewives of Atlanta, which was actually when I joined the cast, it was the second year that they had reached out. The first year I hadn't, I wasn't living in Atlanta yet. And I was mm. like, I don't live in Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I live in Texas, <laughs> but I was doing Central Live with Will Packer. Um, and so that's how I believe I got on the radar for being in Atlanta because I was filming a show here, but I, w- I hadn't moved here full time. I was going back and forth commuting from, you know, in Austin. So anyway, so when the first when it first came, I didn't even really entertain it, think about it, because I was like, I don't live in Atlanta. And so when it came around the second time, um, you know, I I I believe that opportunities come that I believe are meant for me because I'm very prayerful, I'm very positive. Yeah. So I'm always like, you know, if it comes into my 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 aura, then I feel like it's something that I should consider. And so, um, you know, as I was thinking about it, I obviously knew that this one would be a tricky one. You know, like it wasn't the automatic, easy, like, oh, NBC wants you to commentate. Yes. Nike mm-hmm. brand ambassador. Yes. Like that just those things kind of fall within who I've always been and, you know, where I'm headed. How the Real House of Atlanta was like, OK, it comes with a lot, you know, and I knew that I knew what I was I was I was getting myself into. But if I'm very honest with you, I think the for me as a black woman and, you know, the person that was going to be on this show, this was this is what made me do it. This is what brought me to that. Yes. The final yes was that I feel like as a community, a lot of times we ask for we like, I want to see a successful marriage. I want to see a positive person. Da, da, da. And I'm like, I want to show up as that. Like if this is the opportunity to show up as who people say they want to see, this gives me an opportunity to be the one to show up as the positive one and the married one and, you know, all those things. And so I kind of went in with that naivete that I could (laughs) shake things up a little bit, but it's a lot, it was a lot, it's a lot harder Mm -hmm. um, than I imagined. Yeah. Well, I, I love that that was, what helped you, you know, make the decision to finally do it? Because like I said, yeah. that was my, like, that's how you inspired me. This right. is before you were on Real Housewives of Atlanta. So yeah. that means you are, you are, you are in alignment with the calling over your life. I think that is Thank a big, <laughs> that is yeah. part of uh, 
the blessing of you and Aaron's marriage is that you guys yeah. do provide representation and hope mm -hmm. and inspiration mm -hmm. to so many of us. Mm -hmm. Um, and you're right. That doesn't, you know, you had that intention and still it's difficult <laughs> and like, you know, yeah. stuff goes yeah. sideways and, you know, right. whatever, but <laughs> right. you know, it's, it's tough. What, what would you say is is a side of you or a part of you that we haven't been able to experience on the show? Oh, that's a great, that's a great, great question. I think <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, I want to know. Um, yeah, it's a lot. So I would say the first thing, and I think I've, I think that you've noticed actually so off the bat is how much my husband's and my relationship, um, how special it is. Yeah. And I think that, um, unfortunately, because of the way the show is crafted and because obviously it's like six of us and they're trying to tell all these stories and they, they capture a lot of really cool moments with Ross and I that just don't make the show right based on where the, the story is going. So I would say that my husband and, and then also too, I ain't gonna lie. My husband has some reservations too. So he's to me not yeah. fully authentically himself in front of the cameras all the time. That's Neither real. am I. That's like real. We have, yeah, we all <laughs> have up. a little bit of reservations. So I feel like one of the things I had hoped would have come across as beautifully as it is in real life is my relationship with my husband, like how we communicate with each other, how we, you know, and, and like you said, especially now when people are getting divorced so much and there's just so much, like, I feel like people need to see how real marriages work, like how we communicate, how we navigate difficulties. Like, I wish that was mm. on there more. It's been a tricky um, experience, but I still have loved it because uh, to be very honest with you, I've still found a tribe. There are people who mm. have connected with me. There are people who, you know, have fallen in love with me and, and love my husband and love my story. And, you know, all of the things that I'd hoped for are still happening. Yeah. Um, maybe not exactly the way I would have wanted them to, but I still have felt like I've grown a lot from the show. My platform has grown a lot. My reach has grown and, and I'm grateful for that. How long have you and Ross? Oh, you call him Ross. How long have you and Aaron? <laughs> you can call him Ross too. <laughs> okay. I didn't, like, <laughs> how long have you all been together? So this this year, October, will be 20 years that we have been dating. Yeah. So we've been married for 13 years, but we would have been together for 20 um, this October. What would you say is the superpower of your marriage? Uh, the superpower of my marriage, it has been very clear, crisp communication. Like, mm. even when it sucks, even when it hurts, like, even when I know you're not going to like this, but I got to tell you. And I think that we established very early on that um, we love each other so much that we'll never do or say anything purposefully to hurt each other. So if I'm telling you something that it's really awful, mm -hmm. it's because I love you that much that I need you to know this. Like, it's not because I want to hurt you. And I think that, um, I think that has been the, really the magic sauce. Like me and my husband won't go to sleep. Like we will talk all night. Like <laughs> if there's an issue we have, like we will talk about it mm -hmm. until we're on the other side of it. And I think, um, I think that that's, the what I think is lost in a lot of relationships is that people are afraid to sometimes say that thing that could potentially save their marriage or save the relationship, but they're afraid to say it. They don't know how to say it and it's not, or it's not received. Mm -hmm. And so in my marriage, I would say um, that's the best thing I have. My husband, he might be stubborn. Like I might tell him something and he doesn't receive it, but I always know if it's reasonable and fair and honest in a day or two, he's going to come around. He's going to mm -hmm. be, you know what, babe? That's that's true, you know, and um, and I, I hope he would say the same about me. But I would say it's been our communication. I love that you said the day or two. That's to me. That's what I learned about marriage. I'm a very mm -hmm. like instantaneous person. Like mm -hmm. I make decisions fast. I you know I'm decisive. I I I move fast. I talk fast. I do everything fast. Yeah. But everybody's not that way, and my husband yeah. definitely isn't that way. Yeah. And so some what I learned is that it's the day or two. You gotta give It'll it a come day around. Yeah. I used to be <laughs> like, <laughs> why, why isn't this happening instantaneously? You now, know what I mean? But, yeah. but now I realize I've learned him. It's in a couple, sometimes it takes a couple of days that he comes back around because he around. needs, he needs to process in a different way yeah. than I do. Exactly. 
Yeah. Has, is, yeah. is, were you and Aaron always able to communicate in that way? Or is it something that you really worked on and you've grown in throughout your marriage? Um, I would say we started off very, very well communicating. Mm -hmm. um, and I always tell people like the first, <laughs> it sounds going to sound crazy, but like the first uh, probably about 10 or so years of our relationship was like a honeymoon. It, we didn't argue a lot. I don't know how. <laughs> I don't know what. I don't know. I think it was, I do think it was because we had our sports stuff going on. So I would be away for months at a time. He would be, you know, so we weren't, we weren't just like always up under each other and mm -hmm. we didn't live together full time even when we were married because I would be, you know, we were always away. And I think that there was a, a beauty to that. That a lot of people don't realize. Like even mm. now, my husband is in Texas now working for a week. And when he comes back, baby, it's going to be on and popping. Like that stuff refreshes the marriage, right? Like you don't want to be constantly under somebody. And so my job takes me away. So I have those four or five days where I get to be missed and all that stuff. So yeah. anyway, I think that was a huge part of the beginning of our relationship, why it works so well. And then we had a moment actually of struggle where we we're not able to communicate as clearly as we had in the past. And it was after we had my first son, you know, and I think what happened was that for the first time when we were communicating, my husband would hear he's not being a good father. I would hear I wasn't being a good mother. And those weren't the issues, right? It was all, it was about how he and I wanted to be supported now as partners, nothing to do with our son. Mm. And so it was a difficult time of communication for us because he would just check out because he's like, I know I'm a good dad. So it's like, missed me with that. And it's mm -hmm. like, no, 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 I'm not saying you're not a good dad. And it took me a while to realize that's what he was hearing. Um, it was that I wanted you to be a different partner to me now, you know, because we were a party of two for 14 years and then we it's become a now time. party of three. Yes. It's, it's, it, it shocked. It changed our worlds in a, in a, a unexpected way. And so it took us about three or four years to like get back to that place of harmony and, and, and crisp and clear communication again. And like you said, you know, you talk about in, in marriage, it takes a couple of days. Sometimes it might take a year or two, you mm -hmm. know, and it's like, are you willing to sit in that? where you're not at the best place of your marriage, when you know what that looks like and it's down here, like, can you still stick it out and love on that person? Even when it's not there, I think we see a lot of people don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> we see a lot of people being like, forget it. And I want to be like, no, hang on, better days. Like, Because where me and my husband are right now, oh my God, like even better than before. And I thought we were at a 10, we're like here, you know? Mm. So you just got to ride it out sometimes and, and, and love the person in spite of, but we don't have a lot of good examples of that, you know? No, we don't. And I'm so happy you shared that. Here's yeah. the thing too, you know, what it sounds like is like after you had Ducey, which I love that that's his nickname. I'm nickname, upset. Yeah. Also, he's so handsome and adorable. Thank I just you. love him. His spirit is so yeah. sweet. Thank um, you. But the truth is you both changed. You were, yes. you were, all, you were, in a different yes. marriage because you're different people. <laughs> uh, that's, that is, you have to pause on that because my husband said the other day we were on a podcast together and he was like, he was reading some stuff because my husband's very much like always researching marriage and family and black lives, all that kind of stuff. And he's mm -hmm. like, you, you're married to like three or four different people in the span of a marriage, like period. The person you, especially when you start out as teenagers, like it's going to be a whole different person that you're married to at different points in the marriage. You got to get to know that person. You got to love that person differently. And so I think that's a really crucial point that people in relationships need to understand is that please realize the person that you married in 2010 is not the same person you're going to be with in 2023. Like, mm. and you want them to evolve. Hey, I was like, going to no say, it shouldn't I be. I don't want to be married to my college sweetheart. College, like, I don't want that guy. College, Aaron, yeah. that's, no. <laughs> no, that's not, that ain't, that ain't it. That was love it him, then, but, but I need a new. Yeah. Yes, I need a new improved <laughs> version of him at 40, okay? <laughs> you got to come with some new stuff. So, Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. I also mm -hmm. love that Aaron is seeking knowledge. He's he's yeah. reading up on marriage and black yes. love and partnership. Yes. Come on, mm -hmm. shout out to Aaron. You have to, yeah. here's the thing. Seeking knowledge is, is the best way for us to evolve. We have to mm -hmm. seek it. You know, it's not going to come by osmosis. We have no. to. No, I, I wish it worked like that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It'd be a lot easier, right? Yes. <laughs> so, Sonia, you know, watching you... Um, experience 
your live through your miscarriage was heartbreaking. Um, and I, I, I would love for you to share with me what that experience, um, how you grew out of that experience and how it brought you to where you are today. I grew so much from that experience because um, for me, prior to um, getting pregnant with my baby number two, I really struggled with if I would ever have another child. Um, for partially for the reason I mentioned, which was um, it had caused so much strife in my marriage that I wasn't willing to go there again. You know, I felt like my husband and I had finally found our rhythm and routine. Um, I felt like I was at my capacity as a woman to love my husband and my son. I didn't feel like I had any more to give. Um, and I just, I just wasn't sure. I wanted things to be the way they were. Um, and so when I finally had gotten to that place of saying, okay, I'm ready. I feel like my son is ready. Um, I know my husband's been ready. Um, and then I lost it. It just, it really put things in perspective for me um, because the minute you become pregnant and you decide you want to have this child and this is what it matters to you, you become a mom. Like mm. I had started seeing the nursery and all, you know, all this, these things. And so when it, when it didn't happen, and much like you said too, I've always had really good news in my life and always, you know, it was always, it's like always a yes. Like I rarely get no's in my life. So when this was a no, it was crushing, you know? Um, and, but it, 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 I think it was almost, and it's hard to say this, but I almost needed it because it made me value so much my, like, fan, the, 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 the chances of bringing life into this world is such a blessing that sometimes we take for granted mm. that I was like, man, like I, yes, God, like, <laughs> Um, I, this is what I want. Like I, I, like my husband has been saying that our family's ready, and I've been like saying no, 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 no. Um, and I've been kind of selfishly holding off on doing this thing, and now I realize how much I want it, and how much being a mom is the greatest gift, and how blessed I am to have Deuce, and it's going to be an even greater blessing to be able to have two of them now, you know. <laughs> and so, it really it brought it, it it sped up this journey to realizing that this was the best decision for my family. Um, and now I'm so grateful that I am seven months pregnant and that this mm -hmm. one is viable and we got pregnant so quickly. That too helped a lot. Cause how man, soon after? Taken, how quick after? I would, I would say it took us, a, we got pregnant within four to six, four to six weeks. Wow. Because I, um, I remember going to Dr. Jackie and uh, after everything happened and she said, look, if you guys want to start trying right away, there's no research that shows that there's any adverse effects, you know, after you've had a miscarriage. I was like, okay, cool. But I still wasn't like, I was, I was still in the pain of the miscarriage. I wasn't yeah. even like, you know, and so, but my husband was with, with me and stuff. And so, you know, we, I, I, we, I wouldn't even say we were like trying, like, it wasn't like, it was like, we're going to, you know, it was just, it just happened again, mm. you know, like very quickly. And I was like, I couldn't believe it. I was, I, I, don't, I don't think I ever had a period. Like, I, don't, I just think it just like flowed. Wow. Yeah. Like right into the next one. So I think that helped a lot, right? Because when you're going through that kind of pain, but then you have this beautiful thing happen again, it's like it, it erases some of that hardship of, of, of the experience. So, yeah, but yeah, you know, I think I needed it because it, it made me refocus on the fact that I could do this and yeah, we're going to be great. And this is, you know, this is the right thing to be doing at this time in my life. So I'm really happy. Yeah, <laughs> I'm so excited for you, Sonia. What you. has been your takeaway from our conversation? Oh man, Ashley, like you, so I, I want you to know that um, I, I came into the interview not knowing what to expect. I, I'm one of those people who I have a lot of things on my calendar and I, um, you know, I don't always get a chance to like check in on like everything that I'm doing, but I say yes, right? I say mm -hmm. yes to life because I feel if it comes into my aura, it's something that I'm, that is for me to do. And you have lifted my spirits so much um, with a lot of what, um, You've seen in me because my hope is that I put out positives to the world. My hope is I inspire. My hope is that I want to do all these things. And I feel like you 
gave all that stuff back to me today. You know, like mm-hmm. you, you made me know like what I'm doing make, it makes a difference and it matters. And, um, and I just value that so much. Um, and then I think the other thing I got today was we talk a lot about preparation and, um, I feel like you were so prepared for this interview um, and you brought out the best in me. You know, like there's lots of things that I've never said on a podcast or to mm-hmm. anyone. And I think it's because you, you were prepared to, to, to speak to me um, and to, to the things that I've shared before. You, you went deeper. And mm-hmm. so I thank you for that um, experience today. And I do really hope that this interview and this podcast will touch a lot of people and yes. that they will be inspired, that they will walk in their truth whether it's good or bad, um, knowing that it's, it's the whole journey that defines us, you know, um, not just one moment. So thank you yeah. so much. Yeah. Aww, thank you, thank for this you Sonia. Well, yeah, yeah, I was so excited to chat with you. I'm a huge mm-hmm. supporter and fan of yours. Yeah, thank you. And, you know, my takeaway is preparation too. It's, it's, it's that <laughs> reminder of preparation. Uh, yeah. I, I think I, I think I needed that, but also to speak boldly about and over my life. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like you are such an example of, of walking fully in who you are and being proud of that and also speaking the truth about yourself and standing <laughs> in that. And yes. I needed that. And, you were just such a lovely, wonderful woman. And I'm just so grateful that you're in my orbit now. And yes, I'm so too. excited <laughs> to continue to support you and lift you up. Thank you, sis. I honor you. And I just appreciate you so much. Thank you so much. Same to you, Ashley. And we are now connected. We will work together yes. again on something. You yes. heard it here first. Yes, 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 All yes. Right. I can't wait. All I can't right. wait to hug All you right. in real life. <laughs> Thank yes, you. Yes, for sure. Yay, Thank we you did so it. much. This was great. Thank you for listening. This podcast is produced by LWC Studios for OWN. The show's executive producer is Juleka Lantigua. Our managing producer is Fatima El Swiffy. Shanice Tyndall is our lead producer. Associate producer is Mona Hassan. Jordan Thompson is our marketing coordinator. This episode was mixed by Trin Lightburn. Michelle Baker is our video editor. If you enjoyed listening to this episode, and we hope you did, please make sure to subscribe, leave a rating, and review wherever you listen to your podcast to ensure you hear the next one.